Hey, welcome to 938 Online. I'm Rachel Short and I lead our adult ministry here at Project 938. It's really good to be with you. This is a really special time for me because it is that short window of time that's right after Thanksgiving and before Christmas. And I've always loved this time of year because this is when I give myself permission to listen to all kinds of Christmas music. Ever since I was a little girl, I have this rule that I don't listen to Christmas carols or put on my Christmas earrings until after Thanksgiving. Well, y'all, now is the time and I am listening to all kinds of tunes a lot like these. Feliz Navidad. Y'all know this next one. I uh, ho have a balloon Christmas without you. I'll be so blue just thinking about you. Decorations of red on a green Christmas tree. Won't be the same, dear, if you're not here with me. And who could forget this classic? production team never ceases to amaze me. The things that they come up with are unbelievable. Like I mentioned earlier, if you're new, we would love a chance to connect with you. If you could just do us a simple favor and text the word 938 connect to 97,000, this enables someone from our team to be able to follow up with you and invite you to participate in some of the things that we do around Project 938. And one of those things happens this past weekend and it's the Christmas tree project. This is something that is spearheaded by Don Egan and churches in our community and we deliver Christmas trees to families in our community as well as Christmas baskets and it is such an opportunity to be able to bless families in our region and we had an awesome turnout from some 938 folks and so we would love for you to be a part of different opportunities like this and so make sure you're on our email list make sure that you're following us on social media in this time we're continuing on with our series today called carols and we're looking at the different songs the different carols that we sing and these carols have a deep significance a, a lot deeper of a significance than maybe we even think about and so today we're continuing on with angels we have heard on high and josh crumb our family pastor is going to be unpacking this carol with us and so grab your coffee curl up underneath a blanket and sit back and listen for what God has to share with you. i 
938, I've got a song for you that I'm going to teach you today. It's called Sing by Josh Wilson, and here's how the chorus goes. Ready? So sing, God is with us. Sing, He has come to save us. Sing, He will never leave us. Glory in the highest, everybody. Sing to the one who is our King. He has come to bring redemption to us. God is with us. Glory in the highest, everybody sing. Let's try it together, you ready? So sing, the God is with us. Sing, He has come to save us. Sing, He will never leave us. Glory in the highest, everybody sing to the one who is our King.
on a man This Savior King is changing all we know By carrying the curse we bear For everybody everywhere And he lived and died and brought us life And we will rise to meet him in the sky So sing, God is with us Sing, he has come to save us I made an alarming discovery a few months ago. Uh, I was making breakfast for my kids one Saturday morning. Uh, my wife was sleeping in, and so I was just hanging out with my kids, the five of us, and I thought it'd be fun if I pulled up on YouTube some of the theme songs from some of the Saturday morning cartoons that I watched as a kid. So we pulled them up and started playing them, and the, the startling discovery was that I remembered so many of the words. I mean, so many. I hadn't listened to these songs in like 20 plus years. No longer than that, Ugh, almost like 30 years. I hadn't listened to them in, in forever, and yet I knew so many of the words. Uh, it's, it, was, it was crazy, and I can't be the only one, right? So let's see if this jogs your memory. Life is like a hurricane. Just let it soak in, let it wash over you. Duck bird, race cars, lasers, aeroplanes, it's a... Right here. You're bouncing right now. All right, what is it? What's the name of this? What's the name of the show? What's this the theme song for? It is DuckTales. Where Uncle Scrooge defies the laws of physics and swims in a pile of metal. All right, let's let's try one more. Let's see if this rings a bell for you. Nice synth there, a little synth heavy. All right, who are you calling? When you need help, just call. Ch 
Chippendales Rescue Rangers because when you're when you're in trouble, what you want are a group of small animals to solve your crime for you. Let's try another one. Dashing and daring, courageous and kind, faithful and friendly with stories. It's got a real like power ballad -y feel to it, doesn't it? They sing out in chorus, marching along as their song fills the air. So whose song is filling the air right now? Right, who? who what, what show is this? It's... Gummy Bears! Gummy Bears! A show about magical bears who drink a special potion to bounce on the ground. You look in retrospect, you're like, how did that get greenlit? Who, who greenlit that? All right, last one. Kind of an R&B flavor to it. What show is this? It's Darkwing Duck. When there's trouble, you call the W. Like this is my childhood. It's crazy. Like I remembered so many of those lyrics. They are so memorable. Like eerily memorable. I remember what the, remember because I remember those songs, I remember the shows, I remember what the, the shows are about. The songs remind me of a show, which reminds me of a time, which reminds me of a place, and pretty soon there's nostalgia everywhere. Music can do that for us. It can remind us, it can evoke feelings in us, and that's why we're doing this series, Carols, the, the stories we sing. Because when we think of Christmas carols, many of us have sung these songs for, for a long time, but we don't ever really stop and think about the, what are the songs about, what are they saying, and what do they really mean? So we're, we're going to continue our series to, as we look at the song, Angels We Have Heard on High. We've gotten to sing that this morning, and it's really got a fascinating history. Angels We Have Heard on High, sweetly singing o'er the plains, or that's playing fast and loose with the English language there, and, and, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. The words from this song come from a songbook published in 1916, right? but that's not where it started. Right? Those words, that songbook, that version came from the first English version written in 1862 by James Chadwick, who was a bishop in England. But even that's not where the song started, because James Chadwick based his song on a French song, first published in 1855, called Les Anges de nos Compagnes. And if you don't think I spent 20 minutes listening to Google Translate so I could say that right, you're crazy. This song seems to have been used in, in churches more than 50 years before it was even published in, in 1855. And going back even further, there's an old story that this song is rooted in, right? There's this old tradition about this song. It's that one Christmas Eve, French shepherds in the 18th century stood in their pastures with, the, with their flocks and would sing out the chorus of this song, In Excelsis Deo. And it's not the first time In Excelsis Deo or Glory to God in the Highest would be heard in the fields. Because this song is really rooted in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to dig into this story. Starts off by saying, That night there were shepherds in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. I mean, imagine, they're just out doing their thing. They're just hanging out in the fields with their animals, doing shepherd stuff, like sharing their best sheep stories and passing around, you know, jerky and hanging out. I don't know what they did, but they're, they're out, they're hanging out in the fields, and all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord shows up, and they were freaked out. They were freaked out. But if they were afraid now, just imagine what's going to come. Because the angel says, don't be afraid. He says, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Now suddenly, again, the angel was joined by a vast host of others. The armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth with, to, uh, with whom those God is pleased. If they were afraid before when the one angel showed up, imagine how they felt when a multitude shows up. Like they're just doing their thing, 
hanging out and it goes from pitch black to like surface of the sun in approximately 0.5 seconds. Suddenly there's angels there and then the sky is filled with angels and they're singing and it's light everywhere. And it, it's just this overwhelming sensation. I can't even imagine what that would have been like. That's at the point at which my brain would have melted. And the angel shows up with crazy news about this baby. And they're singing too many angels to count. And they're all singing. Like, it's just what a crazy experience. But this story is really significant for us. And I think there's two things that it, that it can challenge us to do. Two things that, that we can take away from this. Two sort of actions that we can take away from this. And the first is worship like an angel. Worship like an angel. Now, it's fair for you to say, what are, what are angels, right? Oh, yeah, that's fair. Angels are heavenly beings, right? They're servants of God. They're created by God, and that's important. They're created by God, right? God is still God and, and in control and sovereign over all creation. Angels are created beings. So they don't have magical powers because they're created by God, servants of God, sent by God, often as God's messenger. They're used by God to care for and to minister to people. Angels' whole existence revolves around God. Their entire existence revolves around God. And the, as they point to God, right, as they point back to who God is, uh, what we see here, this example of the angel in this story, he spoke truth, and that truth pointed to love and hope and peace and faithfulness, that God was doing what he promised, that God was coming to reconcile the world, that he was, he was sending his son is in the ultimate act of his love for the, for the world. But the angel don't just obliquely point back to God. The angel in this story literally pointed to Jesus. He told the shepherds where to go and what to look for. And the angels were worshiping. They were singing out these songs, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. So what's worship? All right, we gotta talk about, if we're gonna talk about angels, worship like an angel, we gotta know what angels are. What's worship? True worship is seeing God as more valuable than anything else. Because when we worship something, we orient our life around it. Worship results in a changed heart and changed actions. And the angels were worshiping God. Now they're impressive beings, right? They're seriously impressive. The shepherds are afraid when the angel shows up. First thing the angel says is, don't be afraid. He says, tell them, don't be afraid. And if you, first thing you have to say is, don't be afraid. You must be imposing. It's like he forgot to put away his flaming sword or something. Now, imagine if you had to go around telling people, don't be afraid when you first met them. Like, there, I, I would develop an inferiority complex of, if I had to walk into Wawa and just say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Like, I don't have to do that. I mean, except sometimes with, with small children because I think, like, I apparently terrify them. I think it's like, I'm tall, it's the beard. Little kids look at me and they're like, ah. But I don't have to do that in every, in every area of my life. But angels do here. Don't be afraid. They're seriously impressive beings. But God is more impressive still because the angels worshiped something greater than themselves. The angels worshiped something greater than themselves. Do you? Do you worship something greater than yourself? Because if we're honest, we often worship ourselves. We put ourselves at the center of our story, ourselves at the center of our lives, and our needs and our wants and our desires become the most important things. We worship ourselves. We cater our lives around what we want. For some of us, we worship our jobs, and our lives are oriented around that. For some of us, we worship our kids, and we've oriented our lives around them. We are quick to worship the wrong things. What do you worship? What do you worship? Because God here is, is definitely worthy of praise. The angels are singing. And it's not just the angels. In, in the song, in Angels We Have Heard on High, it says, angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. So they're worshiping God. Then it says, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. The mountains are singing too which sounds crazy that the mountains are singing, but a singing mountain is not as crazy as it might sound. Creation worships God. In Isaiah 49, 13, we read, Sing for joy, O heavens, rejoice, O earth, burst into song, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on them 
in their suffering. Isaiah 55 verse 12 says, You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hill will burst into song and the trees of the field will clap their hands. There's something powerful about this idea that creation will worship God. That is who God is, that God is worthy to be praised. That God is infinitely power and yet, in the form of his son Jesus, stepping into our story is personally knowable. There's something powerful about what the angels sang here. Something powerful about how God's glory and the experience of it brings peace. Isn't that amazing? That God's presence, that, that God's glory, that, that God, God in, in all who he, he is, experiencing him brings peace. It's counterintuitive. The closer you get, I think the closer we get to to raw power, the more intimidated we get by it, right? I think great white sharks look super cool uh, when I can watch them on TV, but if I was right next to it, uh, I'm I'm not gonna think that's cute. I'm going to be awed by the power of it and glad we're underwater so no one can hear me screaming. The closer we get to something, the more awed we are by it, the more intimidated we are by it. But yet with God, it's the opposite. The closer we get to God, though we may be more awed by him, we're not more intimidated. Because God invites us into his presence to know him. And the more we know him, the more we realize he cares for us, that he loves us. He he is knowable that way. We experience peace. And I love that in this song it talks about peace now being on earth in a newer and in a realer and in a more tangible way than ever before because Jesus was now on earth. Peace is not a thing to be experienced. Peace is a person to know. Jesus is that peace. As the angels are worshiping, Luke 2 continues. It says, when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about, which has to be like one of the biggest understatements in the Bible. They casually said, gentlemen, shall we uh, make our way to Bethlehem? I bet they were like, we gotta go. Forget the sheep. I don't know. Just leave them. I'm sure they'll be fine. Let's go. We gotta go see this thing. Did you see what happened? They hurried to the village, which, yeah, I bet they hurried. And they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in a manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened. And what the angel had said to them about this child, all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Man, I love that. Think about this. God's son comes to earth. And who does God tell first? Shepherds. Shepherds. Luke spends 12 verses talking about the shepherds here. They're referenced 23 times in this this section. And that is significant because when I first had a kid, right? Yes, I told everyone, man. I totally told everyone. But who did I tell first? I told the people I loved the the most. I told my immediate circle. But God tells shepherds here first. And that's significant because shepherds in this culture at this time were lowly. I mean, they were right above lepers, And lepers were avoided because they had a contagious disease. Shepherds were on one of the lower rungs of of society. They were considered unclean. They were considered untrustworthy. We know from documents of the time they couldn't testify in court. They were seen as unreliable. They were unlikely. God chose to share this good news first with the marginalized, with the socially unacceptable people on the fringes of society who couldn't be trusted. That's who God shared his good news with. But they transcended their social status on this night. The first thing that we can do is worship like an angel, orient our lives around God, worship without without abandon, praise him for who he is. The second thing we can do is live like a shepherd. Live like a shepherd. The shepherd, they recognized what was going on here, that something different was happening. They saw and they experienced this incredible moment. To help them believe, God gave them a sign. The angel showing up, right? And they just knew something amazing had happened. Like, they were overwhelmed by it. They saw what happened, but here's what's important. It didn't stop there. 
They had an experience with God, but it didn't stop there. They didn't try and explain it away. They didn't try and say it must have been a comet. It must have been some some natural event. It must have been some bad hummus that they all had earlier in the day. It wasn't any of those things. They engaged in the moment with openness and honesty, and they didn't look for reasons to disbelieve. So how do we recognize when we experience God? How do we recognize that moment? Like We can recognize the... The shepherd's moment, how do we recognize the moment? Well, I want to ask you, are we chalking everything up to coincidence? Are we chalking everything up in our life to happenstance? Do we really believe that we can control everything? Do you see the unseen hand of God in your life? Recognizing starts with the willingness to be moved from where we are to where God wants us to be. We've all experienced Jesus in some way. We all have. For starters... I mean, at the base, most basic level, you're watching this right now. You're participating in this. I mean, unless you've been kidnapped and you're, being, you're forcibly watching this, and I doubt that's happening, then you're here. And you've experienced Jesus in some ways, prompted your heart to be here. We know that God deeply loves people. We know that. That people matter to God more than we can imagine. We know that God has shown himself to people. He's shown himself to us through creation, through the the world that he's created, through the Bible, and ultimately here through Jesus. God does that because he wants us to know him. God wants us to know him. We've all experienced Jesus in some way. And some of us have that experience and embrace it and engage with it. Some of us have that experience and don't understand it and don't know where to go next. And some of us just reject that experience altogether. What's holding you back from knowing Jesus? What's holding you back? What's holding you back? The shepherds responded in this story. I love that. They responded. Right? They recognized that something different had happened. They recognized that God was at work and they responded to it. They acted. They went. They shared. They didn't have to know everything or understand everything. They knew enough that something incredible had happened. And they wanted to know more. They wanted to see. They didn't stop and say, that's enough for one night. Guys, I'm good. You good? Just, uh, we'll take a rest. That's good. No, they engaged. They leaned in. They wanted more. And they did it immediately. In the dark, without getting cleaned up, with no delay. It says they went with haste. They hustled. These are guys who were at work. They're out in the fields. They're hanging with animals. They didn't stop to grab a bite to eat. They didn't shower. They didn't change their clothes. They just went. They just went. There was no time to chicken out or to rationalize what they had seen. They just went. It didn't matter how they showed up, just that they showed up. That's how God wants us to come to him. Right away, right this moment, without worrying about how you look or how you feel or whether or not you have it all figured out, but just show up. The shepherds knew this wasn't just for them. They knew this was for other people. They just had a sense They're some of the first evangelists in the New Testament. These guys weren't experts, right? They weren't experts. They weren't shepherding part-time to put themselves through rabbinical school. They shared what they knew. They had experienced God and they shared that and people responded. I love that. They didn't have to know everything. They just had to know Jesus. And that's true for us. We don't have to know everything. We just have to know Jesus. There's two ways to look at the inadequacy of the shepherds. The first is the angels appearing to the shepherds shows that they aren't inadequate. That God gives them value, that God would meet them, that God would come to them first shows how much he values them. And the second thing it shows us is that often a healthy sense of inadequacy is what it takes for us to stop depending on ourselves. There is a great lie that people will believe about the Bible that that God helps those who help themselves. That's just not true. That God will help those who have reached, have realized they have come to the end of themselves and they cannot do anything. Because when we believe that God helps those who help themselves, who's in control in that statement? We are. Because we're helping ourselves out. And if we're in control, then we don't need God. We don't need God. God helps those who are willing to surrender and come with open hands and say, I cannot do this on my own. I need your help. God, help me. Step into my life. 
Rescue me from these bad decisions that I've made, from the pain that I'm experiencing. Rescue me from orienting around my life, around selfish things. Rescue me from the hopelessness I feel. Rescue me from this hurt. Often a healthy sense of inadequacy is what it takes for us to stop depending on ourselves. How are you responding? Are you waiting for more signs? Are you waiting for more experiences before you respond to what God has already done for you? Are you waiting for God to reveal more or are you putting what you've experienced into action? How are you responding? This story has so much hope. There's so much hope in this story. I love it. It reaches back to the beginning of time, to the promises that God made, and it looks forward to the perfect forever that is coming. In Luke 19, it says, When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. Jesus replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. The same thing that we see in angels we have heard on high. That God is knitting his story together through the birth of his son, the entrance of his son into the human experience. That God knew in our brokenness and our rebellion that we've run from him and we've broken this relationship. We've broken the communion that God wants us to experience with him. But God in his love and mercy and grace says, I'm not okay with the story ending there. And so Jesus steps into time, God's perfect son, to be the peace of God. To live the life we should have lived, die the death we should have died, and bring the peace that we are desperate to know. The peace that we threw away in our, in our sin, in our rebellion. There's so many cool connections in this story. I mean, Jesus is born in the city of David. Right? Well, God had promised to David that a king will reign on your throne forever. Well, Jesus is that king. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. All the promises that were made to say that God will love and care for and protect your people. You will be his people forever. I mean, there's even the, the idea of shepherds, that, that Moses was a shepherd, David was a shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. And just like the shepherds, we are unlikely we are unclean and untrustworthy. Now, maybe I've showered today, so I'm clean, but our hearts are unclean because they're sinful and they're selfish. But just as God came to the unclean and untrustworthy shepherds, he comes to us. Jesus is the Messiah. The shepherds would have been familiar with this idea, the promised rescuer, right? Jesus is the promised re rescuer, but not the way they thought. That Jesus came to not, not to rescue us from our enemies, but to rescue us from ourselves. Jesus was treated worse than a shepherd on our behalf, worse than even their animals. The great shepherd became a lamb to be our sacrifice and ultimately to be our rescue. The message of this story, really the message here of the, the, of the angels in particular, is that God wants you to know him so much, he has come all the way to you. That these heavenly beings come to earth to proclaim the good news that God's Son has entered the world. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Peace on, their, on earth to those with whom God is pleased. The shepherds were an unlikely audience, but so are we. So what's your next step? What's your next step? True worship is seeing God as more valuable than anything else. What are you worshiping right now? It's a hard question because our, it's so easy for us to put something else in that place of honor in our hearts. Do you recognize Jesus as your rescuer? Are you responding to him? Are you in motion or are you stuck in neutral? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the hope of this story. Father, that you stepped into our world in the form of your son in order to rescue us from the brokenness that we experience and the mess that we've made of our lives. Lord, you come to rescue us. Father, we thank you that you would show up to these unlikely and unworthy shepherds 
And we thank you for the picture that you do the same for us. That you don't love us because of what we can do for you. You love us because of who you are. Father, that we don't earn your favor. We don't earn our relationship with you, but that you move towards us in your love and your grace and your mercy because you choose to, because you love us. Father, would you challenge us this week? Would you challenge me this week? What does it look like for me to worship like an angel and live like a shepherd? Father God, we thank you that we can celebrate at this time of the year when peace entered our world in the form of your son. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. Wow, what a powerful reminder that God shows up in the big ways and God shows up in the small ways and that our response is to worship like an angel and live like a shepherd. And this holiday season, we want to invite you to do just that, to live in such a way that's living a life of worship and in service to one another. And so an opportunity that you can be a part of starting next Sunday, December 13th, and then the following Sunday, December 20th. 20th is we would invite you to come to Salt Performing Arts at 10 a.m. and assemble what we're calling baskets of Christmas cheer, kind of like this. I think if we're honest, each and every one of us have someone in our lives, whether it's a healthcare worker, whether it's a business owner, whether it's a friend or a teacher, who we want to bless this holiday season. And what better way to do that than to surprise them with a basket of Christmas cheer. And so bring $20, show up at Salt Performing Art next Sunday and assemble your basket or however many you want and get a chance to be with some 938 folks. We'll be outside of Salt and we would love for you to be a part of it. Also coming up is our Christmas in Westchester, our Christmas Eve services, December 23rd and 24th at 5 and 7 p.m. We're going to be at Thornbury Farms, heated and outside, and it will be underneath the stars. We'll be singing Christmas carols. It's going to be a, an incredible memory with your friends and family. And so you don't want to miss it. You can register online at christmasinwestchester.com. We've made giving very simple for you on 938 online. You can give by just going to 938give.net. Your giving is continuing to change lives in the greater Westchester community. It's enabling our church to help people find their way back to God. It has been so great to worship together. We cannot wait to see you next week.